Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the Celo tech stack. Um, I'm going to be starting pretty high level. Um, I know we have varying degrees of experience in this group. Um, so I'm going to go over like some, some general blockchain primitives, um, go into some of the specifics about Celo and what makes Celo unique. And then I'll go into some of the specific tools about Celo. I'm actually going to be doing workshops over the next few weeks with you guys, where I'll be getting more into some code. Um, we'll talk more about transactions, how to actually do that at the code level, contracts, um, as well as like some art architecture stuff. So this first one's going to be higher level. Um, and yeah, as like Alon said, um, I'm doing developer relations with C Labs. I've been doing this for about uh, almost two years. Yeah, Alon, I think we did the first Celo camp. It was like spring of 2020. It seems like a long time ago. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been great to see Celo Camp grow and um, just like the teams coming through this program are, are awesome. And I love working with you guys. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to get feedback about um, the, to the tools we're offering developers and also just like what you guys need when you're developing applications. Um, I really want to create an environment where we're getting feedback from people that are building applications to, and we can make the Celo blockchain better and make it more user friendly. So um, yeah, as Alon said, like be interactive. Um, Alon can jump in with questions that you guys ask in the chat and stuff. I'm not going to be monitoring that. Um, but yeah, as we go through, if you have questions, feel free to speak up. And then also I'm always available on Discord. So um, you guys can reach me there. But with that, we'll just uh, jump in. Um, and yeah, like I said, to start, I just want to touch on some, some blockchain primitives um, because developing in a blockchain environment is... Um, quite a bit different just in terms of how you're thinking about developing applications and, and products and services than when you're developing web two. Um, and some of the primary things when developing a blockchain are just thinking about accounts, um, transactions, which are like state updates to the blockchain, um, and then just being aware of like how nodes are operating and like how the blockchain is actually structured. So um, some of this high level view might not be directly relevant to building your product or service, but uh, I think it's good context to have just in terms of um, how to understand how people are building. Um, so yeah, with that, we'll just, um, touch on accounts. So blockchains at the most basic level are really just like a public list of accounts with associated information. Um, this table is like a small example, like a sample state of a blockchain where there's just a list of account addresses. Uh, there may be an associated balance, which we usually think of as like a, the currency, um, and there may be code associated with an account. Um, accounts that have code associated with them are smart contract accounts, and they behave quite a bit differently than accounts that do not have code, which are often called externally owned accounts or EOAs. But these are accounts that are controlled by people um, generally, or they can be controlled by computers, but uh, um, they're, they're, not, they're not smart contracts. Um, so yeah. Those, those are the main points. Um, I guess one thing I do want to highlight here is um, this is one of the key components of blockchain security and reliability is just like this idea of having a transparent list of accounts. And um, one of the things that makes blockchain secure is everybody can look at this list of accounts. And the key thing is that we all agree on what accounts exist on the network, what the balances are, and what the associated code is. Um, so what keeps blockchain secure is everybody agrees on this and we're sharing this information all the time. Um, and this gets into like nodes and, um, how the, the blockchain is actually structured. Um, but yeah, accounts are like a very basic, um, primitive in just thinking about how, how blockchains are structured and, um, how we're, how we're interacting with them as well. So when... We have, we have these accounts and we may have, may or may not have code associated with these accounts, um, but to make them interactive or interesting, we have this concept of transactions where um, the balance associated with one account will be updated, or maybe the code associated with one account will be updated um, if the smart contract is doing some ex execution. Um, and those updates just happen through transactions. And these transactions are also publicly viewable, like the entire list of accounts um, and all the smart contract information. Um, and they're also cryptographically verifiable in the sense that um, they are signed messages using public key cryptography. 
So um, when a transaction is broadcast on the network, everyone on the network agrees on exactly who sent the transaction and the data included in that transaction. Um, so it's completely verifiable. And if any of these verifications don't pass, then the transaction is not valid and it will not um, be processed on the network. It will not update the state of the blockchain. So the transactions, those transactions will fail. Um, so these, these transactions are ultimately how accounts interact with the network. Um, a, a, key, a key thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about transactions and accounts is transactions can only be initiated by externally owned accounts or accounts that are controlled by a private key. So smart contract accounts cannot initiate transactions. Um, you can't just have a smart contract that says, um, I want to initiate a transaction at 11 o'clock every Tuesday, um, kind of just like a, a cron job or something. Um, that, that doesn't work. Um, you always need to initiate transactions from externally owned accounts. This has to do with how um, transactions are processed and how we prevent denial of service attacks on the network. Um, all transactions actually cost money to process. Um, there's transaction fees associated with them. So this helps prevent um, people from spamming the network because when you have to spend real money to process these transactions, um, there's incentive to make these transactions valuable um, because if it didn't cost money, you could basically just bog down the network with transactions. Um, like Solana went down a week or two ago um, for I think like 17 hours because transactions were so cheap. Um, that the network just got spammed with hundreds of thousands of transactions and it overloaded the nodes and the nodes basically couldn't handle it and they shut down um, and they stopped creating new blocks. So um, yeah, these uh, transaction fees are an important part of the security of the network. Um, so some specifics about Celo on this point in terms of transactions and how they're actually formatted. Um, Celo has some unique features that make it slightly different from Ethereum. Um, there's a lot of shared history with Ethereum, um, but when you're actually developing tools or like using wallets um, on Celo, you can use Ethereum wallets like MetaMask or Celo specific wallets. Um, so Cel the Celo network does this accept Ethereum type transactions or Celo type transactions. Um, and just like a technical note, uh, Celo uses an account-based data structure for um, just storing all of the account data. Um, this is very similar to Ethereum. Um, it's, it's quite a bit different than the way Bitcoin operates. Um, Bitcoin uses a UTXO model, um, which isn't a, an account tree. It's just a, a list of um, unspent transaction outputs. So just a technical note there. Um, and then the last blockchain primitive I want to touch on is, is the nodes. Um, these are the actual computers that are running the blockchain. Um, Celo is a peer-to-peer -peer network like um, all blockchains. Um, and all peers replicate the state of the blockchain on their, on their machines. Um, so like I said, this list of accounts with associated balances and uh, potential code for smart contract accounts um, all nodes, all validators and full nodes on, in this diagram are replicating that the state of um, that, those accounts. Um, so in Celo, validators are aggregating transactions that are broadcast to the network. So like if we're all sending transactions to the network to update account balances, send uh, digital assets to each other, um, validators are hearing about these transactions, they're aggregating them doing the processing um, to update the account balances or the smart contract code, signing the new blocks, and then adding them to the chain every five seconds. So there's a new block of transactions added to the Celo network every five seconds. Um, and then full nodes in this diagram, full nodes are just verifying that the updates that validators are making are legitimate. So verifying that transactions are legitimate um, and then all of the state updates are legitimate. The full nodes aren't actually creating new blocks or signing new blocks. Um, they're just verifying that all of this information is legitimate. And then they also relay transactions 
um, and data to other full nodes and validators. Um, another thing full nodes do is they serve light clients. So light clients, like in this diagram, they're, they're little mobile phones. Um, and Celo is unique from other blockchains in the sense we have this um, very lightweight client that can actually run on uh, low-end Android devices. Um, this is part of our, like, our value of, or just our mission of making a blockchain that's usable for people on mobile devices, um, reaching new markets and new audiences with blockchain and providing financial services to these folks. Um, there's billions of people that only have access to smartphones. Um, they don't have access to desktops or laptops. Um, so providing a trustless censorship resistant way for them to access this uh, blockchain network on their mobile devices is super important. Um, so part of this like very light client design is um, connecting to full nodes for broadcasting transactions that's coming from these light clients, um, but also making it very easy for these light clients to verify the state of the blockchain. Um, and we do this with some pretty cool uh, zero knowledge proof technology that makes it uh, very fast and easy for mobile phones to verify the state. Um, so yeah, um, these, this is just like all happening at like a, this is all happening at the blockchain layer. Most of you probably won't be interacting with um, the, the nodes or like worrying about the protocol and how this works, but uh, it's good to just start building this, this mental model of how, how the blockchain's running under the scenes. Cause when you're developing uh, your products on, on Celo, like developing in a blockchain environment is a pretty constrained environment. Um, you have limited resources, things are expensive. Um, you don't, it's, it's pretty expensive to just like store data on blockchains. Um, so there's like unique, yeah, engineering constraints that uh, um, are good to be aware of like kind of like why they exist. Um, but yeah, this is a very high level overview uh, intro to this, but uh, there's there's tons of tons of good resources out there to learn more about um, accounts, transactions, and and nodes. Um, like I said, Celo is very similar to Ethereum. Um, the C Labs protocol team a few few years ago actually forked um, the most popular Ethereum client, which is called Geth uh, or Go Ethereum, um, and the, the Celo the Celo team added. Um, proof of state consensus, uh, on-chain governance. We have uh, stable tokens, and we made some substantial like protocol changes. Um, but a lot of the interface and structure of how the blockchain is running is still very similar to Ethereum, um, which is really cool because we can leverage a lot of the Ethereum developer tools, and uh, and it makes it easy for people that are providing developer services on Ethereum to integrate with Celo. Um, but with that, I want to talk a bit more about uh, the Celo specifics. Um, so talk a bit more about the protocol versus applications. Um, dig a bit more into smart contracts, the Celo features, stable assets, um, our unique lightweight identity layer, as well as the new uh, optics standard. Josh? Uh, yeah. Before we move on, there's a question here in the chat uh, from uh, Matthias. Does Celo uh, depend on Ethereum updates or they are now fully two different blockchains? Yeah, so Celo is an independent layer one blockchain. So it is fully independent. Um, the Geth team is continuing to make updates to Geth. Um, I mean, there are bugs that are found. There are new features that are added. There are like improvements that are made. And our blockchain team at C Labs is working on merging those upstream changes to Geth into our current versions. So we are trying to like, we're leveraging the improvements that are made by the Geth team. I and mean, we're working to contribute back to the Geth client as well so we can help uh, contribute to make Ethereum better. Um, but we aren't dependent on it. So if the Geth team stopped doing those improvements, um, we would still have our protocol team working on uh, the cello clients and uh, yeah, making improvements. So um, it's more like a, a collaboration effort, but, and we're not dependent on each other, but we just, 
having multiple teams working on it at the same time just makes makes it better for everyone. Thank you, Josh. And one uh, more question. What are some use cases of storing data on the blockchain? Does it even make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think the first real killer app of blockchain that we've seen is just cryptocurrency. Um, I think there there are certain criteria that makes sense when to use a blockchain. Um, there's there have been like numerous posts written online if you just Google like when to use a blockchain. Um, there's a good comprehensive list, but um, just the way I think about it is like if you want something that needs to be public information and it needs to be like cryptographically verified, um, things like when you're developing a, a cryptocurrency. Um, it's actually not that much information to store on chain. Um, it's just like a number associated with an account. Um, it's publicly viewable. So everybody can access that information, which you would want. I mean, there are definitely positives and negatives to having like a pseudonymous currency um, where everybody can see every transaction, um, but it does provide security guarantees in the case of like how blockchains are currently designed. Um, I mean, there are like zero knowledge protocols that can hide the exact amounts or like recipients of, of cryptocurrencies um, while still being transparent in the sense everybody can view transactions. Um, but the short answer is yes, there's definitely applications that make a lot of sense to um, put on, on chain. Um, and we, we've seen a lot more uh, off chain, like off blockchain data storage applications come up over the past year, like, like Filecoin is a good one, Arweave, uh, Skynet. Um, so if you have like, I mean, with NFTs recently, a lot of JPEGs are just stored on IPFS, um, which is a, a distributed uh, file storage system where consensus isn't as important. And when I say consensus, I just mean agreement at a specific point in time agreement on the contents of that file is not as important. Um, what you get with blockchains versus other off-chain storage options is at any specific point in time, you know exactly the balance of every single account on the ledger. Because um, you just say, what is the block at that time? And then you can, the, everybody agrees on the state of the account, um, the associated code and the balance at any specific block. Um, everybody agrees on that. With other off-chain, distributed file sharing systems um, at different points in time, people may have different data. Like people may not have seen the file yet. Um, it may take longer for them to access. So um, yeah, there's definitely trade-offs and depending on what data you're storing, you wanna use on-chain or off-chain data. Thank you, Josh. We have one more question, but I think we'll move on with the presentation and come back to it at the end so we can uh, see the uh, entire flow of the, of the presentation. Thank you, Josh. Cool. Cool, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a good diagram that shows kind of like the different layers of, of Celo and how it's designed. Um, what I was touching on with the blockchain primitives is really at the lowest level, the, the Celo blockchain. Um, this diagram shows C gold, um, which is the old name for Celo. Um, but at the lowest level, we have the Celo um, currencies, like the, the native digital assets um, we have the smart contract platform, which is like um, the execution layer. Um, Celo is running the Ethereum virtual machine, which is the same virtual machine that Ethereum's running and, and many other chains like uh, Polygon, BSC, um, a lot of the Ethereum rollups now. Um, and a lot of other chains are working on EVM support. So um, that's that's awesome for basically making smart contracts that you write for one chain work on many chains. Um, and it's, there's a lot of composability with developer tools, which is great. Um, so that's the lowest layer. Um, Celo or the C-Labs, the protocol team um, implemented some Celo core contracts. Um, I'll dig into those a bit more later, but essentially like our native stable currencies like um, Celo dollars and Celo Euro are implemented at the core contract layer. Um, Part of our identity protocols implemented at the core contract layer, our on-chain governance process is uh, implemented at the contract, core contract layer. 
so we have part of our protocol that's actually running on this this contract layer um and then most of you guys will be developing applications on kind of like on top of the stack so um you'll be writing part of your applications in smart contracts um, that will be executing on the cello blockchain layer you can also leverage some of the core contracts in your applications um, if you want to leverage the identity layer um, we do have a randomness contract that will uh, make it easy to get random numbers on chain um, it's actually kind of a hard problem to do to get truly random numbers uh, on a blockchain um, but these these core contracts are available for application developers to use um, i mean there there are people that have developed applications that leverage the on-chain governance contracts um, just for making interacting with them easier so um, yeah with that i'll just I just want to talk a bit more about um, smart contracts and like what they are and um, some helpful things in terms of like how to think about them. So smart contracts are, are really just simple, publicly verifiable and accessible programs. Um, so they're, they're public state machines that follow a set of program instructions. And once they're on chain, um, anybody can read the state of a smart contract. So um, any information that you put in a smart contract is publicly accessible. Um, anybody that has a connection to the internet can read it and, and view it. Um, so definitely think about what information is being put into smart contracts um, and, and how it's being put there. Um, so this, this gets into kind of how you think about architecting your DAP and where you want to store data. Um, but smart contracts that support arbitrary computation, like um, like on Celo or any EVM chain, um, the Ethereum virtual machine is Turing complete, so you can compute anything on it. Um, there are there are limited resources just in terms of um, how much computation you can run in a single transaction. A transaction has to be computed within a single block, so there's a limited amount of processing that can be done there. So you can't just do um, as much computation as you want, um, but this arbitrary computation enables general purpose blockchains like Celo and Ethereum um, versus application specific blockchains. So you can really um, design smart contracts to do anything you want. Um, there are obviously applications that make more sense to put on chain versus um, keeping them off chain. Um, but I think this is just important to highlight because we're still pretty early in terms of like using blockchains and designing products for them. Um, so yeah, we're just starting to explore this design space. And I think um, even in the past few months, we've started to see people designing like new types of NFTs and new types of social tokens um, that we haven't really seen before in the past, I mean, six years that like even Ethereum has been around and had these capabilities. Um, so, Another key thing about um, smart contracts is they're composable. So this idea that a smart contract is publicly accessible and publicly readable once it's published um, means that any app, new application can then use any smart contract that has been deployed on the network before. Um, so this just like the more smart contracts that are deployed and used on a network just makes the network even more useful. Um, we saw this like really explode over the past year on Ethereum with uh, like DeFi yield farming, like the, the concept of like money Legos in DeFi, where like all these new applications are just starting to use the other applications in new and interesting ways. And then other applications can start using those. Um, that's like a really novel thing where um, the surface area of possibility just like increases so much, the more um, smart contracts we have and this coupled with the fact that people are developing these applications in an open source way, like generally product projects that are developing on blockchain will have their code on GitHub. They'll write about what they're doing and they want people to tap into their smart contracts and use their, use their stuff. Um, and this is like a very different way of developing software and like building communities and building a user base than uh, we've seen in the past. Um, and it's just like, 
makes the network so much more useful um, because all of these things just they stack on each other and they they get it gets really interesting really quickly. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, Cello runs the EVM. So this means that any smart contracts that compile to the EVM can be deployed to Cello, meaning if you're writing smart contracts in Solidity or Viper um, or like newer languages that are starting to compile for Ethereum, like you can deploy those to Cello very easily. Um, you can, we've also seen a lot of teams that just take open source code that has been deployed onto Ethereum and then redeploy it onto Cello as a part of their um, product or service. They might do some slight modifications um, obviously, if you want to plug into DeFi money Legos that are on Cello, you'll have to change contract addresses and stuff. Um, but there's a lot of code reuse and composability here as well, which um, is just awesome that we can leverage um, work done by existing teams. Um, as I mentioned, we have protocol contracts versus application-specific contracts. Um, and I do have a link here um, to Open Zeppelin where they have they have a great repository of audited smart contracts that a lot of teams will use for developing new applications. Um, I'll share this slide deck with you guys after, or at the end of the at the end of the call, and you guys can get access to all these links. There's a bunch of resources in here. Um, but yeah, smart contracts. I guess just chatting about Open Zeppelin. Um, they're a security focused team. Uh, they're focused on Ethereum, but you guys are probably familiar with a lot of uh, hacks that have happened on blockchain uh, protocols. And a lot of them that happen on Ethereum are really just come down to like bad smart contract design. Um, it's unfortunately pretty easy to write bad smart contracts that handle uh, money in, in inappropriate ways. Um, so the, our, the ability to use code and use smart contracts that have been um, kind of battle tested and other products is awesome. Um, also the fact that firms like Open Zeppelin are publishing audited smart contracts um, for just public use with no restrictions is great. And whenever you can, I just recommend using audited smart contracts instead of writing your own. Um, it's just a much safer practice. So just Josh, looking at... So, yep. Sorry for, yeah, just uh, one small question from uh, Rahu. Is Cello smart contract is fully compatible with Ethereum smart contracts? Yes. Um, so technically there's a small difference in terms of like in Solidity, you can access like block difficulty in a smart contract. You can access, um, I think there's another like global variable that you can access that doesn't make sense in Cello because block difficulty references the like, um, essentially it, it references proof of work. Um, Cello is a proof of stake blockchain. So that idea doesn't really make sense. Um, but I've never actually worked with a team that's run into this problem before. There are some like, there's a few uh, global variables that don't work, but um, yeah, 99.9 percent of contracts will just work and Thank if it doesn't if you if you try to deploy onto our test net and it fails um yeah we'll run into that pretty quickly it will be very apparent so um yeah thank you thank you and one more small question do you have an opinion on rust versus solidity um i don't know rust um so i from what i understand it's much safer um, the problem with it is you, you can't deploy it onto these networks that already have all of these, um, these network effects like Ethereum, you can't write Ethereum smart contracts in Rust, um, or you can't write Rust contracts for EVM chains. Um, hopefully in the future, we can compile Rust contracts that are much safer to write, um, to the EVM. And then that will just become a standard because I think safety first when it comes to smart contracts is a really good practice. But um, for the time being, it's unfortunately, it's just like, it's a, not an option. Thank you. And you can all continue the conversation on uh, everyone can give their opinion also on the, on the chat. Yeah. Um, so this just highlights some of our protocol contracts architecture. Um, we have like our stabi stability protocol, proof of stake protocol, 
our blockchain governance apps. Um, these are all deployed onto the mainnet now. You can use any of these contracts. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight this because um, there's a few things that might be interesting, like CUSD in the exchange contract. Um, the stability protocol is probably, it's one of the coolest things about Celo, in my opinion. Um, since this diagram was created, we've actually launched the Celo Euro as well. So we have the Euro stablecoin. Um, we also have plans to release multiple other fiat pegged, or um, they're not pegged, but just fiat referenced uh, stable coins. Um, so a lot of projects are using CUSD or Celo Euro. Um, and these are, yeah, these are super easy to access. You can also access the exchange contract directly where you can exchange Celo for um, any of the, the stable assets. Um, we have price oracles for the stable assets like a USD oracle and a Euro price oracle um, to help keep our stable assets around their, their targets. Um, that information is accessible to anybody on chain so you can get uh, price feeds. Um, we're also working with uh, Chainlink to get just arbitrary oracles on, on Celo as well. Um, as I mentioned, random numbers, we have an escrow contract that we use in, in Valora, one, our main mobile wallet um, for onboarding new users that's available to anybody. Um, but yeah, just wanted to highlight that these protocol contracts are accessible for, for everyone. Um, this slide highlights just like the, the, main, the main points um, about Celo that are make it a, a unique, um, well, not all of the points make it unique. Like the first point, it's programmable and EVM compatible. A lot of chains have that feature, um, but I actually think the more chains that have this feature, the better, because then we can all leverage the tools and processes that we're, we're, we're just making the EVM better by all using the same standard. Um, Celo has gas payable in multiple currencies, which is unique among uh, EVM chains where um, natively at the protocol level, you can have users pay for transaction fees in Celo dollars or Celo euro. Um, this means you don't need multiple currencies in a wallet to pay for transactions. Um, one of the biggest pain points in ETH is like, if I just wanna send DAI or USDC to my friend for dinner, um, I need to have ETH in my wallet to pay the transaction fee just to send them dollars. Um, that's not the case in Celo. Um, we have on-chain governance for upgrading the protocol. Um, we have stable value currencies, like I said, Celo Euro and Celo Dollar right now. Um, another one of my favorite features is the mobile identity layer. Um, this is actually a more general identity layer, but we're focusing on a mobile identity layer first because we are focusing on mobile users and accessibility. Um, so this means mapping phone numbers to public keys to facilitate um, a better user experience. So it makes it easier for onboarding new users as well as uh, sending assets to people that I that I already know that are on Celo. Um, I can just type my brother's name into Valora, my contacts list, um, and I can just send him Celo dollars by looking up his name and it will send Celo dollars to his account as opposed to getting his 40 character hexadecimal encoded uh, uh, address. So um, that's a super cool feature. We also have fast sync for ultralight clients. I mentioned this in the node slide, um, making it easy to run on mobile devices and we are proof of stake. Um, this means you can actually earn around five to 6% on Celo um, by voting for validators right now. And it also means we are much more energy efficient than proof of work chains. Um, Celo is actually carbon negative, I believe, by the latest calculations in terms of like, we have a certain number of block rewards going to a carbon offset fund. Um, and the amount of carbon that we're offsetting is greater than we're actually using running the network, um, which is super cool. Um, we have native digital assets, as I mentioned, Celo, CUSD, Ciro. I'll skip the slide because talked about that a bit already. Um, Otis is our identity system. Um, it's the, it's short for Obl oblivious decentralized identity service. And this is core infrastructure for that phone number identity mapping. Um, but the cool thing about this is it's designed so that we can add additional identifiers in the future. So we could add mappings for email addresses to cello addresses, um, or Twitter 
accounts to addresses or really any, um, any account where you can receive a message and verify ownership. Um, so this is like a parallel network to the Celo blockchain. Um, but Celo validators are an important piece of the side network. Like Celo validators are actually sending signed messages to your account to ver so you can verify that you actually own the account. Um, but this is a, a super cool core piece of Celo that is, is really different than a lot of um, other blockchains. So um, I have a little diagram here to show what the attestation flow is like for like registering a phone number to um, registering a Celo address with the phone number on the network. And we just have a smart contract on chain that um, validators are watching. You can send a request to that from a user's new wallet. Um, they'll get randomly assigned a set of validators that will then send them a signed SMS message. Um, and then the user will submit those messages on chain back to the smart contract and it will verify that they were received by the, the appropriate validators and they'll, um, then the phone number will be mapped to the address that was sending that request. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty nifty. Um, the question I get asked a lot about this is like, what happens if there's a SIM swap or somebody steals my phone number or something like that? Um, in this case, um, funds are always controlled by a private key associated with a wallet. Um, so funds are always safe, even if a, a SIM swap attack happens. Um, so users will never lose access to their funds as long as they have access to their private key or their like um, phrase to restore their wallet. But what could happen is like if somebody SIM swaps someone else, um, then they could re-register my phone number with their account. So then if like my brother wants to send me CUSD, um, the CUSD could be attempted to route it to this incorrect address. Um, but we have fail safes in this um, system where if there's multiple accounts associated with a phone number, um, the sender will be prompted to select which account to actually send the funds to. And if my brother sees that there's multiple accounts registered with my phone number, he should reach out to me and ask me which account is actually my account. Um, and if I got SIM swapped, I would message everybody in my contacts list and let them know like, hey, um, I got hacked. Um, be careful of talking to people that say they're me on my phone um, using my phone number. So um, there are ways to mitigate this risk. We haven't seen this really, really be a problem. Um, although I have seen uh, SIM swaps have been increasing uh, recently. Um, optics is a new standard that was recently released on Celo mainnet, I think just a couple weeks ago. Um, optics is short for inter or optimistic interchain communication. Um, and it's this really cool design um, developed by C labs where it's, we have this arbitrary message passing protocol. Um, so it's not just a token bridge. You can actually send any arbitrary data across this um, bridge that could be between any smart contract supported blockchains. So you could build bridges between Ethereum, Polygon, and Celo like we have right now. Um, but we can also support like Near, Cosmos, Polkadot, um, any, any blockchain that supports smart contracts can pass messages. Um, so it's, it's really cool. And it's not Celo specific. So like you, Polygon or Ethereum could build a bridge to Near and Cosmos um, and or build a, a link and Celo wouldn't even have to be included in, in, this, um, in this design. So it's, it's really just a, a design pattern that we're implementing on Celo first since we, uh, it was developed in C-Labs. But um, I think the most interesting application among this is a token bridge. So you can actually uh, use this today. Uh, there's a UI at bridge.mobius.money, but it's really just a smart contract that you'll send funds to um, whether from whatever chain you're on to whatever chain you want to go to. Um, there's some links here for references on how to do it, um, but the C-Labs team has deployed a token bridge zap um, 
Zap is our, our cross-chain application nomenclature. Um, and it's just between Celo, Ethereum, and Polygon right now, but we're we're hoping to expand that to um, as many chains as really the community uh, wants us to support. Um, and what's really cool about this is it's not just like a one-to-one -one bridge where like, oh, I'll pass funds from Ethereum to Celo. It's like, oh, I want to send my Ethereum tokens that are on Celo to Cosmos now. I need to go back to Ethereum and then to Cosmos. Um, it, that's not how it would have to work. You could actually just send your tokens that originated on Ethereum now they're on Celo. You could send them directly to Cosmos and then directly to Polkadot, and every every network would be aware of these changes as they're happening. Um, so it's a pretty cool, pretty cool design. Um, and I think we're just starting to even think about what sort of applications we can build um, in this like new, like really cross chain world. I mean, Bridge has really just started taking off um, very recently. So I'm excited to see how we start using this. Um, just across the board, not just in Celo, but uh, among all all the blockchain communities. So um, yeah, I see we got about 15 minutes left. Um, and I just want to touch on some like some DAP architecture stuff, just in terms of how to think about Web 2 versus Web 3, um, like building in like with the Web 2 space versus using blockchain. And then just like a few developer tools that are popular for solo. Um, I know this is kind of a busy slide, but um, basically on the top here, I'm highlighting kind of the, the web two way of thinking about um, designing a, a product. Um, and generally like in web two, you'll have a centralized database for storing information. Um, you may leverage an API service like PayPal or Stripe for payment processing. Um, and then when users are interacting with your DAP, like writing to your application, um, they'll be just writing directly to the centralized database that's controlled by your centralized uh, access control. Um, on the bottom, we do it slightly differently using Web3 um, based on kind of the blockchain primitives that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Um, but uh, user accounts are really like, um, one of the main concepts for like how users are going to, to access, like they're, people are going to be accessing applications through their wallets. Um, and this will not be managed by application or like product or service providers. Um, it's really just like an open permissionless network where, um, access control will have to be managed through either tokens or uh, some other authentication means. Um, but a lot of this will just be managed directly on the blockchain. Um, and then, yeah, crypto wallets are, are people's gateways to, um, to the application as well as their way for managing payments. Um, one, one huge benefit of just like the way Web3 has been moving is a lot of the tools and um, frameworks that app developers have been using for Web2 applications are, are totally relevant for Web3. Um, React is really like the go-to framework for developing Web3 applications, um, just the asynchronous nature of, of blockchains and how transactions are processed, as well as how React is built to handle that, uh, makes it really easy to build um, awesome Web3 user experiences in React. So there's a ton of uh, applications using React as well as Vue and Angular. Um, and yeah, JavaScript is, is the go-to language for sure since we're developing uh, basically for the web. Um, but really with, with blockchain applications, um, the easiest way to think about it is like, you'll serve someone in, uh, interface, just a web page um, that's connecting to a smart contract through through the web page. Um, and then however the the user is connecting to like whatever wallet they're using, their wallet will connect to the blockchain. So if they're using MetaMask, well I'll make a connection to whatever the network they're connected to, or if they're connecting to a mobile wallet through something like Wallet Connect, um, that will establish a connection to that specific blockchain network that they're interested in using. Um, 
So getting into some of the specific tools that developers use. Um, this is a, a table with links. Um, and yeah, we have a Celo SDK um, that we work on in C Labs, and it makes it really easy to programmatically interact with Celo contracts. Um, our Celo, like the, the main SDK is written in JavaScript. Um, since we're building web applications, it's just the most easy. Uh, it just makes the most sense. Um, and like built on this SDK, it's like a, we have a lightweight interface. It's the Celo CLI. Um, it allows you to like check the, the state of Celo blockchain for various protocol actions. Also do um, basic interaction in terms of like staking for validators, um, participating in governance, um, doing certain lookups and like the attestation service and things like that. Um, our block explorer is a, is a block scout instance. Um, so the block explorer is a great way to just view accounts, view transactions, look up contracts. Uh, it includes a rest API and a GraphQL API as well. Um, so you can look up information programmatically just using the API without having to run your own node. You can just ask the explorer for a certain, um, information about an account or a transaction, um, get transaction receipts or, um, yeah, certain data. Um, Alpha Horiz is our uh, developer testnet. Um, we also have Baklava, the Baklava testnet, which is designed for validators to um, test protocol updates. But the Alpha Horiz testnet is a way to like easily and freely uh, deploy your contracts, start running tests. Um, and yeah, it's, it's basically just a, a free version of mainnet where you don't have to use real assets. Um, we have infrastructure tools like Node as a service um, through things like Forno, QuickNode, and Data Hub. Um, these just allow you to connect to the Celo network or allow your users to connect to the network um, through an endpoint so they don't have to run their own node. Uh, we have used contract kit, which makes it really easy to for users to connect their wallets to an application. Um, and yes, yeah, so you don't have to implement like all these wallet connection things. You can just drop use contract kit into your React app. Um, and then you give users a menu of options for what type of wallet they want to make a connection with. Um, and then the graph is infrastructure for looking up blockchain data like very fast. Um, blockchains are hard to query for for data um, they're designed to be cryptographically secure they're not designed to be um, they're not designed for fast data retrieval um, so the graph will index all blockchain data um, and then make it really fast to query um, here i have a list of the most popular cello wallets i'm not going to go through all of them um, we have a handful designed for desktop or like browser-based um, interaction um, it's still quite difficult to design like very high quality UX on mobile devices, depending on what your application is. But um, we do have a few uh, mobile wallet support. Like Valora is the the Cello. Um, it's it was part of C Labs recently became its own company, but it's it's been the go to Cello mobile wallet for a while. Um, we also support MetaMask now, and then Ledger is a hardware wallet. Um, and then here's a shout out to some very popular Ethereum developer tools um, that just work with Celo since Celo is supporting Ethereum transactions as well. Um, so these, these awesome tools can just be used for, for developing your applications. Um, and then last slide, I have a list of resources um, that you guys can browse through um, when I share this, the link to this deck. And yeah, you can ping me with any questions about um, any of the things that you find here, but I think this is a good place, really good place to get started um, in terms of, uh, yeah, starting to dig into resources and uh, looking at code. So um, with that, I'll leave some time for Q&A.